Welcome to everybody and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Warren Maybe. I'm the director of the School of Policy Studies uh, and I'm grateful uh, to be able to welcome you all here today to Queens uh, situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, the purpose of tonight's panel, it's a special event, we didn't have it in our calendar until this week, uh, is to talk about the, the Wuhan coronavirus and uh, what is going on uh, with respect to that, uh, what we can expect. Uh, we thought that as a public policy and a health policy issue that it was a critical thing for the school to, to discuss and to bring people together on. Um, when uh, the idea sort of occurred to us, uh, we reached out to our former director, uh, David Walker, uh, who was instrumental in pulling this all together for this session. So. I'm just going to take a brief moment to introduce our panel, but before I do, I will say that for this session, we will use Slido to take questions as well as questions in person. Um, there is a hashtag for this event. I don't do this very often, but it is hashtag NCOV, N-C-O-V 2019. So if you're a tweeter, you can tweet. Uh, and we're looking forward to having a robust discussion about this. So, very briefly, I'm going to introduce our, our panel. Uh, to my immediate right is David Walker, our former director. Uh, he was the chair of the Ontario Expert Panel on SARS and Infectious Disease Control back in 2003-04, uh, and therefore has lots to be able to say about this. Uh, also a professor uh, in emergency medicine here at Queen's. Immediately to his right is Gerald Evans, who is the chair of the Division of Infectious Diseases and a professor of medicine uh, here at Queen's University. Uh, moving across, we have Dr. Samantha Buttermer, uh, who is a family physician and a resident in public health and preventative medicine. And finally, uh, we have Dr. Kieran Moore, who is a medical officer of health uh, in Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, uh, the health unit, and a professor of emergency medicine. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming all of our panelists uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'll hand over to, to David. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Good. So today, the world's faced with a novel coronavirus outbreak. And our purpose at this session is to consider how well prepared we are to address this, and in particular, to consider whether we've learned policy lessons from similar challenges in the past. For these phenomena are, after all, not new, but have happened throughout human history. My role is to go back to another novel coronavirus, that which caused the syndrome named acute, severe, severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, to review the lessons we learned from SARS and the policies, procedures, and legislation that followed. I will then turn to my colleague expert panelists who work on the front lines, who will tell us about the Wuhan coronavirus and whether the lessons of the past have made us better prepared and protected to deal with the 29 NCOV. In February 2003, a doctor from Guangdong province in China who'd been treating patients with severe pneumonia there traveled to Hong Kong for a family reunion. He checked into the Metropole Hotel, room 911 or 911, for those who believe in numerology or omens. He visited with family, he became sicker, went to hospital, and a few days later he died. His grandmother attended the same family gathering, and on February the 23rd, she flew back to her, her home in Toronto. She died at home on March the 5th, after infecting her son, who subsequently went to Scarborough Grace Hospital. He presented there with fever, cough, and breathlessness, spent time in the emergency room, and was eventually admitted. It was 21 hours later that a healthcare worker who followed Chinese news suggested that he might have the virulent infectious condition that was being reported in China. He died eight days later after infecting many people, including healthcare workers. In the weeks and two phases that followed, the novel coronavirus was identified, 438 Ontarians contracted SARS, and 44 died, including frontline healthcare workers. The World Health Organization issued a travel advisory, and the Ontario economy was significantly harmed, let alone those who lost their lives. Interestingly, 
Another person flew from Hong Kong to Canada at that same time, but they landed in Vancouver and attended Vancouver General Hospital. This patient was rapidly identified as possibly being infected with the disease being mentioned in Hong Kong and China, was immediately isolated, and healthcare workers and the public were protected. BC had only four cases of SARS and no deaths. Why the difference? Vancouver was prepared, on alert, and informed. The BC Center for Disease Control was monitoring the spread of what turned out to be SARS in China and sending bulletins to eMERGE staff and other frontline healthcare workers. SARS was contained in BC and in many other places, not in Ontario. Ontario had no Center for Disease Control and was not issuing bulletins. We were not looking, so we were not seeing. Soon after, in April 2003, I at the time was Dean of Medicine at Queen's, received a call from the Ontario Minister of Health, Tony Clement, who asked me to chair an expert panel on SARS to identify what had gone wrong in Ontario, what we had learned, and what should be done. I've no idea why he chose me. I knew nothing about infectious diseases and still don't, but he did. <laughs> Simultaneously, the federal government appointed U of T Medical Dean Dr. David Naylor, it must be something to do with deans, to carry out a similar task from, from a national viewpoint, and Justice Archie Cameron was appointed in Ontario to consider the legal and occupational health and safety issues around SARS. The three investigations with different mandates nevertheless worked very collaboratively. The expert panel I chaired met frequently for over a year and made over 100 recommendations. Boiled down, we said, Ontario needs to do what BC and others do. Ontario needed to rejuvenate public health capacity, which had been degraded over the previous decades. Some may remember Walkerton, or the tainted meat scandal, or the HIV and Hep C blood supply contamination that, occur that had occurred in that period. Specifically, the panel identified the need, first of all, to utilize best surveillance strategies at the international, national, provincial, and local level to identify and respond to infectious disease threats. It was not lost on us as individuals that Canada had been participating for decades in NORAD and the Continental Anti-Ballistic Missile Shield with 24-7 surveillance for incoming missiles, but not for incoming pathogens. Secondly, to create the capability to employ rapid and clear communications and alerts across healthcare sectors and with the public, including on a digital platform. For example, we discovered there was no single simple method to communicate with all the doctors in the province. People had to use a mixture of phone calls, faxes, snail mail, and the use of the evening news. Thirdly, to improve emergency preparedness. Fourth, to ensure an educated and protected workforce by making substantial improvements in infection control practices, gloves, gowns, masks, etc., as they did in BC. Fifth, to empower the Chief Medical Officer of, Officer of Health in the province to provide evidence-based independent advice to government and the public and, and I stress this, to dissociate public health communications from political communications. Who do we actually need to hear from? And six, a la BC and many, many other jurisdictions, to establish a public health agency for Ontario at arm's length from government, a crown agency with many functions, but to include responsibility to incorporate and strengthen public health labs to link with local pub public health units like Kieran's, with the academic community, and with the Public Health Agency of Canada, which, had, which the creation of which had been recommended by David Naylor, and beyond that to the international community. Subsequently, and with a new government, our recommendations were accepted by the Minister, George Smitherman. A formal public health capacity review was undertaken. Legislation was introduced, a crown agency, Public Health Ontario, the name is the Ontario Agency for Health Protection and Promotion, was created, and many of the panel's recommendations were adopted. So I'll hand over now, because I will depend on my colleagues to provide opinions on how well those hard lessons learned worked. And in particular, we're going to start with Gerald Evans, who's going to tell us about the culprit, the 2019 NCOV. Thanks, David. Uh, Chris is just going to come up and switch over. So in 10 minutes, I am going to fly through a lot of information. Um, and uh, I, I think I can start off by saying 
the reason you're going to see about 28 slides in 10 minutes is an example of how fast communication is now happening as compared to 2003. So there's my big comparator. So what do we know right now? First of all, most of you may be aware that today WHO finally got around to saying public health emergency of international concern. I thought they should have done it last week, but I'm not on the WHO. I'm just a goofy infectious disease doc in Kingston. So we're going to talk uh, with this next stuff, and I am going to have to use this. We were worried. The PowerPoint thing said, you have not yet activated your account. Miss him? <laughs> there you go. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about epidemiology, a little bit about virology, and I do apologize for those of you who are not in medicine or science, so I'm going to try and like not use too much lingo, but I do use lingo as a, as a I'm an academic ID doctor. Talk about what it looks like in humans and a little bit about infection control measures and stuff. So this is really what the, the, the pandemic looks like. And I just wanted to really kind of point out that if you look here, this is actually not working, that red arrow is showing you December 8th. That was actually the first case. Um, and that's relevant because some of the information we're getting doesn't jive with the fact that that was actually the first case. And what you can see in the, the darker uh, orange uh, bars there are those that were linked to the marketplace. And everybody's heard about this seafood market that actually happened to be selling illegal wild animals as well. Of the first 41 cases, um, only 28 of them actually had a link to the market. 13 didn't. So it was not a common source outbreak, which is what we were led to believe early on when the first reports came out. And you can see that this uh, really took off. And I won't there's a lot of stuff you don't want to read in that. Uh, this is the uh, most recent thing that I sucked off about two hours ago. The John Hopkins puts this up. It's a real-time sort of following of the cases. You can see that the epicenter clearly is uh, China, and there's an epidemic curve at the bottom that shows you sort of just the uh, cumulative number of cases that have occurred. Be very careful with this. They always report numbers. The number's always bigger. What we really want, and, and which I think uh, Dr. Buttermer and Dr. Moore are going to talk about, is we need to know rates, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that. This is the epidemic curve in bigger time, and you can see this large accumulation of numbers. Uh, be careful about news reports that say, oh, there were a thousand more cases today, but yeah, that's just a thousand more cases. What's the rate and what's the denominator? Um, if you want to look at it sort of a nice color perspective, it starts in the middle of China, Wuhan, which is actually an incredibly important transportation center in China. Almost everything that happens in China goes through Wuhan because you're going east, west, or north, south, it goes through there. So that was not a great place to have it start. But you can see in this color map, it just moved. And that's 10 days of, of spread of uh, reported cases. And it gives you the density of cases in each of these different provinces. And it's now been reported in every single province in China. Tibet finally per, uh, uh, reported a case yesterday. This is what it's looking like around the world. These are all the countries that um, have now reported cases. And of course, we're in there as well. Um, I, I've been keeping a tally and a spreadsheet to have fun with um, as I sort of track where the cases are. These are the cases outside of China. Uh, and as of about an hour and a half to two hours ago, this is the last slide I fixed up, it's actually 107 cases, which I think is kind of funny because some of the other guys are saying there's about 89 or 90, but it's actually 107 based on the reports of confirmed cases in all these countries. So there's more than that. But compared to what's happening in China, nothing. I throw this up because this is the question I get asked by everybody. Um, and this is a subtotal to look at the total number of deaths over the number of cases. All the deaths have happened in China. There's been no deaths outside China. Case fatality rates about 2.1%. SARS is about 10 or 11%. Uh, this is about the case fatality rate you see with seasonal influenza. 40% um, of cases have pneumonia and about somewhere around 11, 12% are severe cases, meaning they end up in critical care settings within the hospital environment. Um, great paper that was just published yesterday uh, by the group from China looking at transmission dynamics, which is really kind of the, what I as an ID doctor am interested in and what public health people are interested in. So very quickly, the mean incubation period is 5.2 days. There is a broad range. It's from anywhere from 1 to 14 days. But right now it looks like it's about 5 days. Um, and then you get 95% of cases will present within 12 and a half days. So a little bit longer incubation period than we like. We like shorter ones because it's easier to spot them. The epidemic is doubling every 7.4 days in China. The RO, so that's the basic reproductive number. For, so if you're an epidemiologist, you're going, oh, cool, he's got something here. So th they're estimating based on 425 patients got an RO of 2.2. To put that into perspective, seasonal influenza has an RO of 1.28. 
So this is the number of cases generated by exposure to a case in a group of susceptible individuals where transmission is happening. So a, a, the bigger the RO, the more I'm worried about. If you really want to put it in perspective, measles is 19. So, okay, so measles is really contagious. This is somewhere a little bit more, at least based on smaller numbers, more than influenza. This is what the curve looks like, and this is actually my first comparator slide. The blue is uh, SARS, and the gray is uh, novel coronavirus. So it's got a little bit more of an exponential type curve for all you mathematicians out there. Uh, SARS had a, a slightly different curve. So some of these things are early, but we are paying attention to them, and this is just some sort of projections. And this is based actually just on the number of reported cases from the time the outbreak was sort of determined. So SARS way down there, and this one. So that's the only way we can compare them is how many days things have been out. There's clear human-to-human -human transmission. We've got up to third-generation transmission, so a case transmitting to another case, who then transmits to another case to another case. It's probably large respiratory droplet, but we still don't know. And coronaviruses are interesting. None of you are maybe virologists. Well, actually, I got one of my buddies over here as a virologist and a couple others. So coronaviruses are notorious for getting in the GI tract and the respiratory tract. And during SARS, we actually worried about diarrhea and, and um, overflow from sewage that may have transmitted it. That's just interesting about coronaviruses. Um, there's a big thing that's been going around, and this is one of my chances to do a myth bust, the asymptomatic transmission issue, that patients can transmit if they're asymptomatic. So the fact of the matter is, and this is a good quote from Tony Fauci, uh, and he says, even if there are asymptomatic transmission, in all the history of respiratory-borne viruses of any type, asymptomatic transmission has never been the driver. Driver of outbreaks is symptomatic people. So stop freaking out. But my favorite question is when somebody said, well, what if they're have a little bit of a cough. Well, I said, then they're not asymptomatic. They're symptomatic. Anyways, it has to do with definitions, people. We're pretty tight on this kind of stuff. All right, anybody wants to see the enemy? That's it right there. This is from the paper that was just published a couple of days ago uh, from the Chinese group. That's the coronavirus. I, I don't have a pointer to sort of show you, but there are little spikes around this electron micrograph over here. These are viral particles within the respiratory epithelium on the right-hand side. So that's what the enemy looks like. It, unfortunately, it just looks like every other coronavirus on the planet. This is a uh, genomic <laughs> analysis. Uh, this will drive some people crazy, but the red stuff you see there in the middle, that's the coronavirus from Wuhan that we're looking at. And up at the top in blue is the SARS coronavirus. So there's a degree of relatedness, but don't get too hung up on it. There's about 80% homology in these sorts of things, but, oh, Kieran's got me a, a thing here. There's about 80% homology between these, but if you're a virus, 80% homology is really not that close. I mean, we, we get all excited when it gets like about 99% homology. So in fact, yes, it's related. They're both beta coronaviruses, but not that much. So here, by the way, is MERS. MERS is over here. That's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome um, virus, which has a much higher mortality rate, actually. Oh, I have to go between flippers here. Um, so a comparison between... Uh, Wuhan here, that's MERS, that's SARS, and then just remember that coronaviruses, there's a lot of human coronaviruses that float around that just cause the common cold, OC43, 229E, and a few others. So it's a broad spectrum of disease that's, that's there, um, and really the only thing that's interesting about these two viruses at the moment is they both emerged in China, and given that coronaviruses are important pathogens and viruses in animals, and the proximity of animals to humans in the country of China and the opportunities for that exposure sort of drives some of the things that, that we're seeing. So where did it come from? Good genomic analysis looking at a number of isolates around the world. Basically, they have very limited genetic variation. So this is just one virus that's emerged. It's a little bit like what SARS was too. So it's not like there's a virus and it's mutating like crazy and there's all kinds of different strains. This is the same virus. The genetic variation tells us that probably, this is what my virology colleagues are good at, it probably emerged sometime in the month of November. Uh, originally when you look at the sequence of changes that have occurred in the germs. So coronaviruses and other viruses have a frequency change of mutation and this, this hasn't happened a lot so it's probably relatively new but it also tells you that probably even though the first case report that came out of China was I think December 30th, 31st was when they declared it, um, it's not. The other thing is it's not from snakes folks, it's a bat coronavirus, it really has resemblance to it. The poor snakes, they already have a bad rap so <laughs> just, just kind of leave them alone. The, and that, that's a problem related to looking at repeated codons and stuff that you see in DNA analysis, and some of them look like snake stuff, but snakes are reptiles, we're mammals, last time all of us checked, and so I don't think it's an issue. The marketplace is interesting, this is the, a lot of the stuff about here, but as I already mentioned, 13 of the original 41 cases had no link to the marketplace. 
And it's what we're thinking now, and probably analysis will show us, is the virus likely came into the market before it came out of the market. So the marketplace isn't the place that it happened, but probably someone who was infected was in that area, crowded circumstances, lots of opportunity for transmission. And uh, the uh, Chinese public health people have reminded us that the early report said most cases were with the market. So there is a little bit to the nuance of most, but not all cases. But that was reported by the media as all cases. Um, so one of the cool things is this infects humans exactly like SARS does. It goes through an angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. So that's really cool because there was a lot of work done on vaccines and drugs back at SARS days. So some of the SARS stuff is informing us where we would likely to go with this. We don't know exactly what the target site is, probably upper respiratory tract and or lower respiratory tract, but there could be other ones related to the fact that it's a coronavirus. And as I said, although we know that the general incubation period is about five, six days, it's a very broad range, at least reported cases of one to 14. Um, this is again from the recent paper that looked at days from infection to symptom onset, and you can see this curve. So most of them are occurring way over here, at least within one week. There's a bit of a longer tail out here. And then serial infections uh, have a slightly longer incubation period. And then from illness onset to first medical visit, so when people get sick, they're showing up at the doctors fairly quickly, but there's a range of people waiting for up to seven days. And from uh, time you got sick to the time you're in hospital is around 10 days. That's a lot related to social function of when you see a doctor and when the doctor thinks you're sick and when they stick you in hospital, so don't worry about that. So the first 41 uh, cases, most of them again, actually in healthy middle-aged people, uh, with a, a, some skew over here, not too many reported yet in pediatrics. A few of them are now popping out. Um, and again, not all of them linked to the seafood market. This is a little bit of timeline of illness. So this is looking at onset of symptoms and then looking how many days until you got admitted, until you got short of breath, until you developed an ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what doctors worry about a lot, and when you ended up in intensive care. So this is going to help me, at least in the hospital environment, and my colleagues who work with this about what we're likely to see if we see cases, what's, what it's going to look like. Remember, it's only 41 patients. What do people have? Basically a fever, a dry cough, and some shortness of breath, which is actually exactly like SARS. Um, in terms of the symptom complex. Um, it is not related to the fact that one patient that we already saw who, who felt perfectly well but said that um, he had been to China. So that's okay, lots of people go to China, but if you don't have any symptoms, it really doesn't matter. Um, that's a semi-funny thing, you guys can giggle if you want. So signs and symptoms, this is a, just a big complex table, but basically showing that there is a myriad number of symptoms. This is a comparator between people who ended up in the ICU versus those who didn't end up in the ICU. Not a lot of difference in terms of, of uh, what we're seeing uh, in terms of statistical significance and stuff, but again, small numbers, 41, you may miss differences in things. This for, I, I'm most of you aren't clinicians, but this is, this is not a normal chest x-ray, just to let you know. Uh, that should be all black where there's air and there's a lot of water and other stuff in there and that's what they look like and that you can see why they end up in ICU and intubated, ventilated and sick. And again, if you, uh, I certainly remember x-rays from the SARS days were being reported, they look quite similar. So it's a nasty respiratory virus and it produces pneumonia in about half of the people who get it. One of the things, just to quickly comment, it's going to segue into what Sam and, and uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Buttermer and Dr. Moore are going to talk about, which is this whole issue, what's the right right? So we're seeing lots of this. Uh, many of you know that the masks are flying off the shelves all over the place. Masks publicly are really not useful. And I would say that for China as well as Canada. Um, the problem is, is it's probably more useful to put a mask on somebody who's sick to prevent them from aerosolizing stuff than it is for you to wear it. Um, if you don't wear a mask properly or whatever, in which most people don't, in fact, the utility of it plummets to nearly zero. And at best, the only thing it might do is if you got a funny thing on your face, you might not like touch your face all the time, which is what people, believe it or not, you all do a lot. The narcissists do it a bit more than other people, but, but we all do it. Um, in the hospital, we're promulgating this. This is a, this is a healthcare worker with excellent uh, things. They got an eye shield, they got an N95, gloves and gowns. We don't need this. This is what you're seeing out of China right now. And this is what we did with Ebola. But Ebola is a totally different virus. It is completely, utterly different. It's a sticky virus with a high fatality rate. And so hazmat suits and all that other, ex in what we called enhanced droplet and contact precautions was needed. But we're, we really are still working on exactly what we want to have. So very big, dynamic, evolving situation. Lots of science. I've already shown you way more science that's emerged in one month than happened within the first six to 12 months of SARS. That's how fast science is moving and the communications are getting out. 
So this sharing of information is light years, light years ahead of what we saw in 2003 with SARS. However, the new thing that we didn't have in 2003 is this social media stuff. And it's real bad. I'm on Twitter. Fortunately, I have a private account, but um, the Twitter stuff is just crazy. So um, that's, what I think, are going to be our next big challenge is recognizing what does social media do to us. When it comes to infection prevention control in the community, it's all the good messaging that my public health colleagues tell you about. Wash your hands, sneeze and cough into your sleeve, stay home if you're sick and get your flu shot. If you're in the hospital, we even brought in precautions, but they're not Ebola hazmat type suits with taping and scenes and double gloving and all the rest of that goofy stuff. What do we need? Well, we need urgent next steps in identifying the most effective control measures to reduce transmission in the community. By the way, China's only reported 14 healthcare workers who have been infected, but that's old data. When I say old, that means it was last week. So we haven't heard anything from them uh, since then. Um, working case definitions are still being worked out. Um, my, my colleagues at PHO, and I happen to work a little bit with PHO, we've already got them out as everybody else has, so we know what they're, but they may change as we understand more. Um, and the characteristics of cases should continue to be monitored to see if there's any change in the epidemiology. Viruses do have a nasty habit of changing how they work. Viruses, by the way, are not living things. It's just a bunch of nucleic acid with a protein coat and sometimes a lipid envelope. They're not living creatures, so don't, don't, they're not bacteria. Um, so where are we now? Cases mostly have been in China. Over 99% of the cases are in China. Uh, other cases of, uh, other countries have seen them, including Canada. It's primarily a respiratory disease. I've talked to you a little bit about things you can do to reduce transmission to not, in, but it doesn't include wearing a mask in public. Do not wear a mask in public. Next thing you know, you know you're going to be arrested by the police for, for some kind of nefarious activity or something. And if there is a case suspected, the one good thing that came out of SARS was our ability to look at those processes, follow and identify people and manage patients. So I think we're in good shape in the healthcare environment. And then this is my last one, which really needs no discussing. Thank you. Over to Sam, Dr. Bottomer, Sam Bottomer is going to go next. Can you believe the influenza went up, actually? I really like that. Because <laughs> I don't have slides, so it works. It's a nice image. There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so just to preface a little, I'm a public health resident, so I've spent the past five years of residency learning about outbreaks. We've spent so much time talking about hypotheticals, and um, I think part of that shows that the world we live in as um, public health trainees has changed dramatically since pre-SARS. So we've spent so much time covering this material because we've expected that we might not have known that we were going to see this virus right now, but we know that there are going to be emerging infectious diseases throughout my career, throughout your lives, and what matters is that we take a rigorous systematic approach to dealing with them. Um, and I can say with confidence that our public health system here in Ontario and across the country has a rigorous systematic approach to dealing with novel outbreaks. Um, we, we are not repeating the same mistakes as with SARS in terms of lack of communication and lack of information. And so um, starting with a strong public health foundation, we still do lack a lot of information. Like Dr. Evans was saying, we don't have all the details. So, in these sorts of situations, we love knowing, you know, how long is the incubation period where people go between getting exposed and getting sick. We like to know, you know, what percentage of people are the most unwell. And really, we truly don't have that information yet. Um, what's coming out of China is that generally people presenting to hospital are the ones getting tested, um, but there are some media reports of people having less severe disease. Uh, the cases in, in Toronto so far, we have, we have two, um, one individual who was in hospital and is doing well, and one individual who was so well she didn't need admission. And so this is presenting a bit of a challenge in terms of gathering information because we only have confirmed cases by testing, and if you're not presenting to healthcare, you're not getting tested. So we can't say anything with certainty about, about the severity of this illness at this point. What we can say is that of the people who've presented to hospital in China, this percentage of people are unwell, and this percentage of people have died. So it's really important to keep that in mind, that there's a difference between the number of people that have truly become sick and the number of people that we're counting. 
Um, and, and hopefully with time over the next few weeks, we'll gather more and more information. The benefit of close contact tracing that has been done from an international perspective, so everyone who's presenting um, into Canada, into the uh, crossing the border, they're getting information about this, and they're being told how to contact healthcare if you start to be unwell with a contact or travel history. And, and so we are in a position where we can catch people who are less unwell. We're not just relying on people being so sick that they need to access the hospital. And so we might see differences in the epidemiology of the international cases versus the Chinese cases. And, and that's just gonna come with time. We don't have those answers yet, but we're working on it and we're keeping a close eye on that information. And so what I wanted to foc on, focus on here was actually more around what Dr. Evans was ending on, and it's this idea of fear. As humans, we have fear of the unknown. It's, it's natural and normal for us to fear what we don't understand. But we're actually in a position where we understand an awful lot more about this than we did understand about SARS for, as you said, even a year after SARS was over. We really are doing a lot better in terms of gathering information here, but it, it doesn't mean that it's not scary, right? Because we don't, we don't have a crystal ball. All we have are our tools at our disposal to try to work on containing this and, and confidence in the tools that we have at our disposal. And so what then it, what I ask you all to do, which is really difficult, is to try to turn that logic center on in your brain and turn the fear off and use your common sense when dealing with this situation, which is, is hard, right? Because it is scary, but fundamentally, the way we're gonna get through this is if we're all reasonable about it. And so, um, as Dr. Evans was sharing, the biggest things that we can do are working with, um, taking an opportunity to use this uh, to be kind to each other rather than um, showing prejudice to one another. And, and for that, the first step is good hand hygiene, staying home when you're sick, getting your flu shot, and um, covering your, your, your mouth with your elbow when you cough or sneeze. Because fundamentally, this virus might cause, we might see more and more cases in Canada, but we already know there are many respiratory viruses that spread in our country every single winter that get people sick and people do die from them. And, and we can use this opportunity to freshen up our skills to protect each other from things like influenza. Because fundamentally, these are good principles to carry through your day-to-day -day life, but this is a good opportunity for us to remember that it's, it, it's so important. The other thing is that this gives us an opportunity to support each other and to protect each other um, uh, across the board um, instead of using this as an opportunity to show prejudice. So I don't know how many of you in the room remember with SARS, um, a major issue that came out was prejudice against the Chinese Canadian community. Um, and we've already seen some instances internationally of, of groups showing racism towards Chinese individuals or pe people who appear to be Chinese. Um, and uh, really, we're not going to make headway in this sort of, um, in attacking this sort of illness if we continue to segregate each other. What we need to do is come together as a global community and see ourselves as part of one group working towards eradicating this virus. And so the best thing that we can do is not, um, not shaming one another or avoiding one another um, just because of appearances, but rather, again, turn on that common sense. If people are sneezing, stay away. <laughs> if someone has a fever, say, you know, if you're an employer particularly and one of your, your staff is unwell, let them go home, right? Let's set the norms so that we all take care of each other rather than um, trying to create barriers between one another because that will just stoke further fear. We're seeing a lot in terms of social media that isn't reliable information. Um, and I would urge you when you're following this because it's new info every single day, try to use reliable sources of information. Johns Hopkins has been putting out situational reports twice daily uh, that have been very informative. Um, and I would encourage you, you can subscribe to them, get them by email if you're interested in that much information. But if not, use your reliable news sources. So um, go to places like Andre Picard, who's a very reasonable health reporter, 
read his articles. Don't just read what pops up in your Facebook feed. Because fundamentally, what we need is, is everybody to be on the same page in terms of um, uh, working on understanding um, and not allowing some of these inflammatory um, articles that aren't based on science and aren't based on facts to, to prejudice our uh, approach and, and opinions of one another. So that's what I was hoping to share with you today. Thank you so much for listening. And now Dr. Moore will tell us even more about the public health response in particular. Hi, my name is Kieran Moore. I'm a, a proud program director of public health preventive medicine following my resident who uh, I have the pleasure of working with, and I've worked with David uh, on the Walker Panel Report. Uh, and I think we have had significant improvements in the public health care system uh, over the last 15 years or so. And I'm just going to quickly go over some of them, and I think we'll just open it up to converse, uh, conversation afterwards. Is that okay, David? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just reinforcing that there is a fire hydrant of information out there. Uh, coming at us very rapidly, and I, uh, I recognize that it's very difficult to digest, and I'd only uh, echo Sam's uh, comments uh, and Gerald's that we have to look at best evidence. We are looking on a daily basis at all the evidence and trying to create summary documents. We can share those with you on the risk to our, our community, um, but we're watching this very closely, that uh, you have our assurance uh, that as your local public health agency, we are coordinating with our provincial colleagues and our federal colleagues and monitoring the situation very closely. We have much better data than we've ever had before, and Gerald showed you many of the papers that have been published very rapidly, and uh, John Hopkins' real-time surveillance uh, system. I'd also, as your public health physician, need to put this in perspective, uh, and Sam's uh, done very well doing that. There are many other risks to us in our community, uh, and the top 10 causes of death in our community have, uh, have only one uh, listing for infectious diseases, being influenza and various pneumonias. That which kills us on a daily basis in our community, many of which are preventable, are the neoplasms, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, accidents and injuries, uh, chronic lower respiratory illnesses such as COPD, et cetera. Uh, and as your public health physician, uh, if we want to stay healthy, let's concentrate on the basics. Uh, please concentrate on eating healthy. Take a half hour. I have you as a captive audience. I have to say this. Uh, take a half hour out of your day and have a walk. Enjoy the fresh air. Our days are getting longer. The skies are blue. Uh, that will keep you healthy. Don't uh, smoke tobacco. Don't vape unless you're trying to quit. Follow uh, Canada's low dr drinking guidelines, especially students at Queen's, please. Please, <laughs> having worked in the emergency department uh, at Queen's, uh, we, we are very familiar with gross intoxication. Uh, get immunized, um, build important fr friendships over time, create a social network, support yourselves, reach out if you need help, and turn off the news and social media from time to time. T please, this weekend, just turn it off, stay away from the internet, uh, and go for that nice walk. Put things in perspective. All that being considered, <laughs> There's now a global public health emergency being declared. <laughs> but please, go for a nice walk this weekend. This was the epidemic curve of SARS back in uh, November 2002 and 2003. I was working in Emerge. Gerald, you were working in, in ID at KGH. Uh, and uh, we have had significant improvements in the healthcare system in Ontario and in Canada since this time. I do believe the lessons have been learned. Uh, this uh, epidemic went on for seven months uh, and affected 8,000 people, caused 800 deaths, a 10% uh, mortality rate roughly, uh, and went uh, global. It was mostly in Canada a nosocomial, so a hospital spread infection, didn't get into our communities. Whereas this uh, novel coronavirus is different, um, it is spreading in the community as we speak, and our Chinese counterparts are working diligently uh, to try to control their infection uh, at, a, at a rapid uh, pace, uh, given that it's community spread, uh, much different than uh, SARS was, and it's a, a much tougher enemy uh, to control. Uh, and and uh, they have done uh, 
drastic measures to try to control this at a community level through their uh, quarantining. Uh, 41 million people locked in their communities, uh, not able to travel. Uh, to try to protect the rest of us around the globe uh, from um, this infectious disease threat. So just to go over uh, at a local level in public health, um, we have infection control experts now. We have a, a designated communicable disease team. We do have the capacity to go out and test for this coronavirus if someone phones us or a primary care partner phones us, just like they've done in Toronto, Vancouver, to go to their homes, do the swabs, and have that person isolated, uh, and then follow up with any contacts. We have much better capacity at a local level, and you have our assurance at a local level that we will respond and do the testing in the community if required, or at Kingston General Hospital if required. And we have coordinated that pathway with our primary care partners, with our acute care partners, uh, uh, Gerald's permissions, et cetera, uh, and feel confident that if we get a case of a novel coronavirus at this early stage in this outbreak, that we will respond at a local level and be able to contain it. At the provincial level, uh, through David's work, um, we have the Public Health, uh, Public Health Ontario uh, and the Public Health Ontario lab system. Uh, we didn't have capacity to test for uh, SARS early on. There was no test. And now we have a test that can be done in Ontario that will be confirmed at the National Medical Lab. So significant improvements in the lab system uh, to have that shared uh, between China and the rest of the world. The whole genome sequencing is remarkable. And at Public Health Ontario, we have great experts in surveillance, epidemiology, uh, immunology, infection prevention and control, which we never had uh, and we've learned from SARS and have these in place. The government has tried to do cutbacks, but I think this outbreak has um, calmed their <laughs> the modernization process, what they called, of public health. Uh, and uh, I think uh, hopefully they'll realize our value in controlling and limiting the spread of this infection. And at the federal level, Dave mentioned the Public Health Agency of Canada was created with the input from David Naylor. Uh, and they, uh, at, a, at a national level, are coordinating the provincial responses. The provincial responses are coordinated, uh, coordinating the local responses. And we're all communicating on a daily basis, uh, sharing information, and discussing best practices and how to protect you uh, from this infectious disease risk. And then our federal partners are communicating on a daily basis uh, with the WHO. So these communication pathways are a remarkable improvement. The laboratory system's remarkably improved. And our infection prevention and control practices. I, as an eMERGE physician, would walk into any room, not ask about screening, not wear a gown and glove. Uh, 2002, David, do you admit to that? Just to, and, and you may take a travel history while you're in the room. Uh, and then if they said they went to China, you wouldn't even uh, care. You would just... Uh, assess them if they had a viral illness or bacterial illness and walk out. Now we screen as soon as you come into the emergency room by a triage nurse. If you're a risk identified as a possible traveler, a mask is put on you, you're put into an isolation room which vents the air outside, not back into the hospital. Uh, and we, uh, in the eMERGE I was practicing in, didn't even have a negative vent room in 2002. And now almost every emergency department in our province will have one room designated for infection prevention and control for negative venting, and the patients will be appropriately isolated to prevent hospital spread of these illnesses. And we have experts like Gerald to care for them uh, across our province. So that's a remarkable improvements. And then the timeline of sharing from December 31st, where China communicated to the World Health Organization that they had that cluster of severe pneumonias, it's been a remarkable uh, 29 days uh, where the information has been shared, uh, the genomes has been sequenced, the testing has been shared around the globe, and we're having uh, uh, transparent uh, communications uh, uh, regarding risk. And we have websites like Gerald has showed that can give us a daily count and daily updates on the epidemiology. So from my vantage point, it's been a remarkable improvement in our acute care response, our primary care response, as well as uh, the overall public health sharing of information to protect everyone in this room and in our community. And I think I'll stop there on, on those improvements at a, at a macro level, and perhaps we can open it up. So, questions, please. Um, I think Chris has a, Myron, you have a question. And Chris has a microphone. 
Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question here is related to the virulence of the uh, coronavirus. And uh, uh, it seems to have a, a high rate of mutation. It could be a, a mutation from the SAR coronavirus that uh, is manifesting in this. And if that's the case, uh, uh, how high is the virulence of this in terms of affecting people? It seems to be an upward curve. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, is there any treatment for this kind of a viral infection? Go ahead, Charles. I guess that's me. Um, well, it, it's not a mutation of the SARS coronavirus. Uh, it has some genetic, like I said, some homology, but it's only 80%, so that would be an enormous number of mutations. Um, and you've got to remember, these coronaviruses pop out all the time. Coronaviruses are ubiquitous across the animal um, world and cause a whole host of diseases in lots of different mammalian species. So uh, I don't think it's a SARS mutation. Actually, the genetic drift has been very small so far. Does it have the capacity to mutate and change how um, it might produce disease? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the cool thing about viruses is actually you, the virus doesn't kill you. It's your host immune response to the virus that kills you. So um, uh, it, sometimes people don't recognize that, but like when influenza kills you, it's because you're too healthy and too young and you've got a great immune system, so you, you kill yourself. So the, I, I don't think that that's going to be a big concern. Uh, there was a lot of SARS uh, research done after SARS in 2003, including a number of publications looking at vaccination develop, uh, vaccine development as well as chemotherapeutic uh, interventions. We know the cell surface receptor, if we can block it, and you can block it with interfering RNAs, you can block it with other soluble uh, ACE2 things, but they were never put out large because once we killed SARS, once SARS died out, it, it didn't reappear. It was a, a chance mutation. My, my personal view, just as a goofy infectious disease guy, is that uh, these, are, these one offs are going to occur f not infrequently. Uh, if we can control it, then the likelihood that, that, that this virus will re emerge and be able to infect is probably low, much like we saw with SARS. SARS disappeared and it never reappeared again. But the frequency with which these are going to happen is increasing, and that relates to the fact that there's so many of these zoonoses, these are infections in animals that, that jump to humans and then are able to uh, transmit themselves human to human. Um, and you know, the pandemic influenza of avian flu viruses we're always worried about are huge. We, I always said it wasn't gonna be H7N9, which everybody's watching. I said, it's gonna be a left field coronavirus. And I was right yet again. Um, for all my former house staff, you always know I always say that. But uh, so this is what's gonna happen. But right now, no therapies. Karen, you wanted to comment? So just for some of the students in the room, uh, we always look at the epidemiologic pyramid. So we, we know the deaths that have occurred, we know the hospitalizations, and from that we're calculating a, a case fatality rate, which is around 2%. Uh, SARS was around 10%, MERS is around 30%, Ebola is around 60%. So of those viruses, 2% is relatively low. Uh, pandemic uh, influenza was around 0.1%. As we know more about the epidemiologic period of, of really what illnesses are going not detected in the community associated with coronavirus, I anticipate that the case fatality rate will get less and less and less and less. As we understand this transmission in the community that patients are only having coughs or colds or upper respiratory system symptoms and not lower respiratory. So we'll get a, it's early days, we'll get a much better uh, understanding of this in the, in the coming weeks, but I anticipate it'll, it'll be even lower uh, than the 2% that's currently uh, commented on. I have one question at the back and then I'll go to Slido. The RO number remains two right now, but if it starts to increase, what other attributes would be um, present to determine that it would be an airborne uh, presentation versus the droplet? And I saw from one of the slides there that the hospital is definitely, um, they're mandating the airborne protection as well as the droplet, but so far the WHO is, or, um, has announced that it's just droplet. So in the healthcare environment, we work on the precautionary principle because we don't know enough yet about transmission. We put in all of the provisos, droplet contact and airborne. We have no evidence right now that it's airborne. Um, and it might be a little bit unusual for a coronavirus to be uh, an airborne virus, meaning suspended for long periods of time in small droplets. So I, I, that's just a precautionary principle. We'll do that when we get more science back. We may change it and just go to droplet and contact, which is what we do for influenza. 
Right. So, so some of that's going to be informed by the epidemiology as we look at some of the exposures. So one of the things that might hint at airborne is that somebody who had no contact with a known patient had been in an enclosed environment where that pa someone who had this infection had been hours beforehand. So that smells of airborne. The other thing is that they'll, they're immediately doing studies to look at animal models and to see if generating an airborne situation in an experimental model allows the, the virus to transmit. And those ones we're still waiting on, we'll have some answers back in the next little while. So the public health and epidemiology guys really help us out with determining a little bit about that sort of mechanism of transmission. Yeah, it just has a lot to do with the mechanics of small droplet versus large droplet. Most of these respiratory viruses are large droplet, and in some cases you can have fomite spread, meaning that the virus might be on a surface and you wipe it and hit your eyes. So that's the part that we're, we're still kind of working on in terms of trying to understand the science of transmission, but we'll get clues about this. Right now, I mean, if you look at what little evidence is out there, it does not look airborne. So thank you for those questions. Um, Yes, during the SARS uh, expert panel, we, we had experts telling us about the physics of flying phlegm, um, goobers flying across rooms. Uh, from Slido, uh, and please, those of you who have devices, you can vote on these, so the popularity of a question may rise or fall. But the first one is, do you believe that the 20, 2019 NCOV will end up being a regularly circulating coronavirus? I would say we don't have enough information yet, but if all of our actions work, then no. And if you believe me, that's what I just said a few minutes ago. I think this is a one-off, like SARS. Okay, thank you for that. Any other question from the audience? Yes, over here. She answered some of my questions. So I'm a nurse in the emergency department, actually, so this is near and dear to my heart, for sure. Christmas. And now that the um, World Health Organization has made it a global emergency, do your, your expert, expert opinion, do you think it's because of the globalization of our country and that we are safe because we have precautionary principles put in place and it's more about other countries who aren't as fortunate as us to have the knowledge base that we have? Uh, thanks for your question. Nice to see you. Um, I, I think we're very fortunate to have the, the infrastructure that we have in Canada. I, I do, would fear, uh, as we've had a case in India, that they may not have uh, the same infrastructure and capacity to isolate individuals and quarantine contacts. Um, we have a rigorous uh, s system here where we will uh, trace every single case. I do have questions about other countries and their capacities, uh, and, and this is something we'll have to be watching. If something is going to go global, it's going to happen in the next uh, several weeks that we'll be able to monitor whether there's ongoing spread in other countries. Right now, there's not ongoing spread in any country because we've been so rigorous uh, in isolating these individuals. And, and uh, these individuals that are returning have been behaving quite appropriately, self-isolating, reporting to public health and their primary care providers, and getting appropriate testing. So everything has been working well in Canada to date, but I obviously don't, can't have the same confidence in all countries around the globe. Charles? No, I, I think um, the, the recommendations now of having N95 is a real abundance of precaution. I, I personally don't think it's necessary. I do believe only if you're doing aerosolization procedures where you're going to be actively intubating patients and, and goobers, okay. as David would say, would be, would be aerosolized. That, that is the really only indication for N95. If you're, uh, you, so you have extra precautions having N95. I think a surgical mask is adequate, and that's why our primary care partners are using surgical masks. But we're even asking patients before they attend primary care to call public health, and we'll guide them through how to, where we want them tested and where we want them to have contact with the health system. So I think the communication is going to be working very well, and we will warn Emerge well in advance, and our ambulance and EMS partners, of any risk of a patient that you'd be coming in contact with. So at a, at a local level, I, I have a significant confidence that we, we can uh, uh, identify individuals at risk early and protect our frontline healthcare workers. Charles? Ooh. 
So, uh, it, I mean, in IPAC, we're, we, we really don't think there's anything more that you have to do. Certainly hazmatting and stuff like that is just not appropriate. It's not a sticky virus or anything like that. And even the use of other weird things like pappers and that is probably not appropriate at this point, and I, I doubt that it will be. Um, the, the WHO clearly said there were two reasons why they went with the uh, Public Health Emergency of International Concern. They said, one is there's too much spread outside China. And the second one was exactly what Dr. Moore just said, which is that they are not confident that all countries around the globe have appropriate uh, measures in place to control it once it would arrive in their country. So those were the two reasons they stated that they went with the PHEC. So and just a last comment. I think sometimes in the hospital setting, it's really easy to get lax with um, infection prevention and control. So things like hand washing between patients, wearing your mask, wearing your, your gown, um, depending on what the precautions are. And um, it's really, like I said before, this is a good opportunity to kind of use this as a reminder that those precautions should be followed with all respiratory illnesses, regardless of travel history, and make sure you're protecting yourself. And then when you go in the room, you can double check the travel history. It's it's never wrong to go over it twice. We know that it's happening at triage. We know for most people, it would even be happening before triage because they would be calling into the hospital or to um, their primary care or to us at public health. Um, but it, it never hurts to ask again. Um, and the best time to ask is when you're already protected wearing your PPE. So from Slido, I, I guess this is an extension of the same question about sticky and flying phlegm. How long would the uh, virus live outside the body on surfaces? Totally unknown at the moment. Uh, coronaviruses do, uh, other coronaviruses uh, can uh, be uh, viable on inanimate surfaces for up to a couple of hours, but um, that's just a general view of coronaviruses. We don't know about this one in particular. So a Purell wipe when you get on the train on the armrests and the tray table. <laughs> and, and wash your hands. And wash your hands. <laughs> don't touch your face. All right, back to the audience. Yes, a question? Hi there, uh, my name is Jeremiah Locke, and I'm a senior manager with uh, Addictions Mental Health Services, KFLA. I'm here with my colleague, Nora Lobb, who is our pro program and policy consultant. So just uh, wondering from the community health perspective, uh, we're right now processing a lot of uh, external referrals uh, and intakes. So should we be adapting any of our assessments, including that question about China? Do you think we're at, at this point right now? Or is there other, other pieces we should look at from a process quality improvement perspective? Um, Right now, I, I think all of our healthcare partners should be uh, having hand wash stations. Uh, should uh, have a signage that's appropriate for all primary care settings, including your own. That if you've traveled uh, to uh, Hubei, Hubei province in the last 14 days, have any acute respiratory illness, and or have been in contact with anyone uh, from that area with acute respiratory illness, that uh, they can call a nurse helpline, they can call their primary care provider or public health. Uh, and we will give them guidance on how to get assessed. All of our healthcare providers in the front lines should have signage like that and screening protocols in place. Thank you very much. So do you have the signage available? Yes. yes. Yep. All of our primary care partners should have them, right? Yep. Uh, and we can share. You can, contact. you can contact our communicable disease team and we can make sure to get that to you. That's the message to everybody. For anyone. <laughs> So oh, we have a part, of the, part of the question though is just the issue of active versus passive screening. So we do active screening in the hospital at certain uh, high risk entry points, but we do passive screening otherwise. Um, so I can't emphasize enough, you are much more likely to get flu by an order of magnitude of 10 than you are to get this virus here in Canada, certainly here in Kingston. This is, this should be, you should be smart and aware of current events, but there's just no way anybody should even think they're ever going to get this. I mean, right now, at this point, it's just not going to happen. So we've been, it's amazing how we've tried to message a respiratory illness and travel, particularly to either Wuhan or Hubei province, where Wuhan is the major city. Um, and somehow that gets turned into, well, if you just, if you know the word China, or if you have symptoms, but you haven't left Canada in 40 years, you should get checked for this. Yeah, so. Yeah. Is strategic, is that not a great move? Because then we cause more worry. stress and fear. But if it's passive, I, I don't think it's a, I don't necessarily yeah. think it's a bad idea. And that's what I think that's that Kieran and Sam are saying.
And I would say it wouldn't be a bad practice to just have general respiratory screening on arrival. Um, and then if anyone screens positive, you could ask the travel history. But realistically, people who have illness should not, they, they should be wearing a mask. PPE should be used. If it's a home visit, you know, that can be delayed a few days until they're doing better, right? So I think in general, screening for respiratory illness is, is a reasonable idea. Hand wash stations, always good. Let's reduce the burden of influenza in our community now and, and other coronaviruses that spread all the time that, that make people sick. And just as another advertisement for our, our great nurses at our <laughs> KFLA Public Health, they, we have gone out proactively to many of our primary care partners and we're happy to, to go out uh, to your clinic uh, and walk through a patient's uh, pathway through your clinic and have appropriate hand washing stations, just as uh, Sam has said, for normal precautions for respiratory season. So uh, we're nearly out of time. There are four questions on Slido. I'm going to present them all at once in a sort of bullet fashion. Does the flu shot protect against this over and above being an excellent preventive practice? No. no. Any recommendations on disinfecting a patient room following a suspected 2019 NCOV? Really, it's kind of what, I mean, yeah, I, I, that, that's probably, we, we clean all rooms when a patient's been somewhere, yeah. uh, and if they have an ARI, the ARI screening is classic, everybody should be doing ARI screening, but there are no, at the moment, recommendations for more extreme measures. No. Um, if someone who is asymptomatic transmits the virus, can the newly infected person present symptoms? So the, the, we don't have all the information about this yet, but there was a case of an individual in Germany who either had mild or no symptoms, um, had been in China, and individuals they were around did get sick. And then on the, her travel back to China, she developed symptoms. So the, the symptoms first presented in the person that she was in contact with. We can't be 100% sure that that's who gave who what, because um, we, we just don't have all the information. But um, viruses present differently in different people. Um, so one person might develop a lot of symptoms, one person might not, and if you get enough of the virus into you, you might be the person to develop a lot of symptoms, you might not. It's, it's very variable. So it is uh, six o'clock. Uh, last words, Sam, Karen, Gerald. <laughs> uh, last words, stop freaking out everybody, this is not a big problem. <laughs> I, I will, I'll say it, let's say more kindly, let's um, keep an eye on the media, reliable media, stay informed and employ your own best practices to prevent the spread of illness in our community regardless of what virus it is. Half hour walk a day, that's all. <laughs> <laughs>just want to briefly say thank you to all members of the panel. This has been incredibly informative. Uh, I think that it's a very useful uh, set of information, set of data that's been presented to us. I hope that everybody leaves here feeling more informed and, and better capable of understanding what's going on. And thank you for coming out. Have a safe evening. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good job. Thank you.